By PC Pod or Pad, you're listening to Paid to Play. I'm Rob Farker, your host for this exploration of the dangerous idea that bringing your whole self, especially the parts of you that seem silly, geeky, or odd, into your income-generating life is one of the best things you can do. It might not be easy, but it is easier than we think and even fear. And with the help of my guest for this episode, I'd like to show you how. Now, it's a particular pleasure having this guest on my show because her current line of work is a line of work that I myself have been dabbling in and would be interested in moving into uh, on a more professional basis. Anne Twarick is a graduating university student from the United States. Uh, She is about to complete a degree in education, but her passion lies in voice acting. Though she is only 21 years old, she has had almost 10 years of experience behind the microphone. She has completed work for international companies, as well as small-time amateur character projects, and currently has ongoing projects in both the commercial and character acting fields. If you've been listening to this podcast and watching the launch parties for the last little while, you might be aware that I have been doing a little bit of work for a podcast called Random Transmissions, a fortnightly weird fiction podcast. Bookending the short stories that get read out on that show is a little bit of fiction created by the show's host, Justin K. Day, where he plays the host of a recording sent back in time from a perhaps not too distant future, where the blister winds have rendered the surface of the earth uninhabitable, and those few that survive are forced to eke out their existence in underground biopods that support them while they try and figure out what to do next. And in those bookends, Justin introduced the character of Pixel, a friend of the hosts who mysteriously vanished. And when he sought out the voice talent to bring Pixel to life, he found Anne Twarick. So it is a particular pleasure again for me to be chatting with her for this podcast. Anne, thank you very much for coming on the show. Thank you so much for having me. I'm so excited about this. <laughs> and thank you once again. My guests will probably not be aware of this, but uh, uh, I do have to thank you particularly for coming back again. This is our second attempt to get this podcast underway after networking issues at my end uh, unfortunately made the last attempt uh, unintelligible. So uh, uh, thank you again for more of your time and your graciousness in that regard, Anne. Of course. No, it's quite a pleasure to speak with you. So uh, imagine for a minute that after this episode wraps up, I hand you, even though I am in Australia and you are in the States, a magic ticket that grants you the opportunity to do something that you've either been keen to try out or keen to get back into, as well as a magic rearrangement of your schedule to allow you the necessary time to do that thing. What would be on your short list? Well, I would probably take that magic ticket and uh, put it towards something uh, like an acting class or a voice class. Um, I've never taken one before, and I'm very keen to to try out something new and put myself in an in a position where I have to have to grow. Maybe then I'll play a, a good RPG video game or something afterwards. <laughs> <laughs> well, if you'll excuse a very quick geek out, uh, what are some of your, some of your favorite video games? Oh gosh. Um, well, I have just finished playing the Mass Effect series. Oh. Um, <laughs> quite the tearjerker there. Yes, absolutely. Um, and then I'm also um, a huge fan of the Dragon Age series. Um, and now I am venturing into the Skyrim uh, area, <laughs> which I've tried many times. But uh, because of the way that I'm used to playing uh, games, I've been hesitant to try. Um, I'm always in stealth mode, which makes it very difficult to move from town to town in Skyrim. <laughs> Mm, mm. I, uh, I've tried Skyrim once myself, couldn't quite get into it unfortunately, but uh, I do know what you mean uh, with completing that fantastic Mass Effect trilogy, I mean it's kind mm-hmm. of right up my alley, sleek futures and awesome spaceships and things like that, and mm-hmm. oh boy did uh, um, 
I didn't play through it again to uh, uh, do the see the full developer's cut ending, but even um, finishing Mass Effect Three uh, right when it came out and amid all the furor about how it ended, I mean, mm-hmm. um, regardless of that, it's God, it still delivered a, a whopping great punch, didn't it? It did. It was a real, real powerful emotional bomb for lack of a better term yeah um definitely made me tear up at the end for sure Mm. now you mentioned uh, when we were talking about the magic ticket that you've not had any voice talent or general acting classes how did you then sort of encounter um voice acting and discover that it was the thing for you well um i first began it when i was about 12 years old. Um, and my father was a, uh, was a video producer, a small time, had his own business. Um, so I was really around the video production entertainment industry for, um, a long time prior to my first time behind a microphone. Um, and around the first time that I heard him editing a, uh, voiceover piece, I kind of realized that I want to be that voice behind the behind the microphone, and I was lucky enough to have his support and his equipment <laughs> to <laughs> to start venturing into that. Mm. So, uh, can you remember what the first uh, thing that you did was when you actually got behind the microphone? Oh, probably something terribly embarrassing. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, at 12 years old, I guess you can't really expect much more. Mm, mm. Um, I think it was an amateur animation, probably on YouTube. Um, <laughs> I think probably some sort of magical girl animation thing that was mortifying, I'm sure, to watch now. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I tell you what, it's easy to look back at some of the, uh, some of your earliest stuff and cringe. It's, uh, it, it's sometimes hard to remember though, A, you know, you were young and you were just starting out, but I mean, B, that, uh, sometimes just making that start can take, um, an incredible, uh, leap of faith and courage and that, uh, quality regardless, um, Sometimes uh, the the best way to overcome that cringe is just to think that you know that was my first thing. Everything everything went on from there. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Yeah, exactly. And even today, those kinds of uh, of character acting, uh, cheesy animation, cartoon shows that are you know fan made, they still hold kind of a place in my heart. Um, that's very fond to me. Yeah. And I think sometimes when it's a fan-made production, you know that you're working with people who are having fun with it, if you're not exactly. I mean, they're there because they are fans, yeah. Um, so uh, in that case, I mean, how much, um, uh, when, how old were you when that happened? I mean, as we mentioned at the beginning, you're 21 years old now, you have a decade of experience behind the microphone, uh, was that when you were, we, when you were 10, or were you um, a little bit earlier, was that a little bit earlier even, pardon me? Um, I was actually, I think, uh, nearing my 12th b- birthday when I first um, got behind a microphone. I think it was for Christmas um, of that year that I received my first uh, microphone. Mm. Oh, fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, are you uh, enough of a, uh, an audiophile to sort of remember what kind of microphone it was, or was it just enough that it was, you know, it was your mic? Well, it was a, um, it was a terrible microphone. It was one of those, <laughs> it was one of those probably $10 ones that you can get at any, uh, uh, electronics store. It's a USB microphone, um, which, you know, if you're an audiophile, if you're interested in any of the, um, any of the vast majority of microphones available, uh, USB mics are not the first choice. Mm. Um, but, you know, it was, it was a, Good mic for for what I was using it for for practice and for um, kind of entertaining myself and playing with my voice a little bit more. Hmm. So, so good just for getting that basic technique uh, practice of technique in. Exactly. Hmm. Exactly. So then, um, how did you get your first uh, gig 
as a voice talent and how long, uh, how old were you when that happened? Um, well, I was probably 15 or 16 when I got my first paying gig. Um, and I ended up getting it through my father, um, in a way. Uh, I still had to do all the audition, uh, processes and, um, I had to, you know, talk with, uh, with people via email. However, uh, my father was the one who ended up kind of setting me up with the, with the shot, with the, um, casting call in my hand, um, and the script. Mm. So, um, I'm really lucky to have someone who was so well networked to help me get into the, into the business, even if it's a slow slide into the business. Mm. Um, for my first time. <laughs> uh, I have to ask very quickly, I mean, that's a, a gap of about three or four years. What sort of stuff were you doing in the meantime? Compre- completely amateur stuff. Um, I joined a, an online forum um, for amateur voice actors called voiceactingalliance.com. And um, I don't believe that it's very active nowadays, but in those years, um, it was very, very active. And, uh, fans and, you know, small time producers that didn't have any money, um, students, they would all post their, um, pretty much completely free volunteer gigs on, uh, this forum and you would be able to audition for them. Um, many of them were fan dubs of anime or f- of video games. Um, but it was an excellent place for, me to get started and kind of test the limits of my voice. Mm. So I really appreciated those years for that experience. Yeah. Uh, now, of course, fan dubs and what have you sort of, I think, uh, from what I understand of them, um, having been exposed a little bit uh, to them in the uh, various anime clubs I sort of was in a little bit, in uh, the mid to late 90s, there's always a little bit of a, a legal grey area with those. So um, uh, if you don't want to really answer, I can certainly understand. But can you remember any particular projects that um, you did during that time that you sort of, uh, you know, that stuck with you or that you really had fun with? Mm, I um, I remember playing Sailor Mars um, <laughs> for a... It was a completely... Um, fan created project in which it was um sprite animated <laughs> <laughs> yeah it was a very uh very funky project mm. um but it was sprite animated and it was all these different characters from video games and anime and cartoons um that all came together for a game show it was kind of a survivor esque <laughs> game show <laughs> so i was playing the sailor mars in this um in this project and mm. it was probably a terrible, terrible Sailor Mars, but, um, you know, it was really, really fun. It was so exciting to be able to play a character that I'd watched on TV as a child. It was amazing. Mm. That, um, that sounds like it would have been an absolute, uh, absolute blast to do, especially, um, as you mentioned, all these characters from all kinds of shows and franchises together in, uh, this one game show format, it sounds like it would have been a, a fun little mashup. It definitely was, for sure. So anyway, uh, moving on to that first gig, uh, what can you tell us actually, I mean, you mentioned the audition process. What was the gig itself? Um, the gig itself was for a corporate um, project. Um, the company was Steel Incorporated, uh, which is a German power tool company for any who don't know. Um, and it was looking for a voice to, um, to voice their factory entrance video. So kind of a safety protocols, welcome to our factory kind of, uh, brief video shown to any visitors or to, um, new employees. Mm. So, um, that was the job and it was a, a very simple job, simple narration, nothing fancy to it. Um, but it definitely gave me a look into what exactly it took to, to do this professionally because you had to network with people and, and email back and forth with the producer. And my father was in my room directing me while I was, you know, recording and it was almost embarrassing to have him there listening to me. But I knew that 
that's what you needed, you know? Mm, mm. Now, uh, so far, I've got to admit, my experience of uh, doing voice work has been pretty much, uh, by and large, either being alone at my house uh, or at a friend's place. Um, I am lucky enough to know a fella who I actually chatted with for an earlier episode of the podcast. I'll just drop his name very quickly, Matt Bond, um, who has been in the audio industry for a good while. But even then, his presence was more just uh, managing the recording um, rather than directing. So that is an experience that I am uh, yet to have. Um, generally, I mean, of course, that first experience with your father there, uh, as you mentioned, made uh, made things a, a little bit nerve-wracking. But can you tell me a little bit more about that experience of actually working um, in a booth or in a studio with a director? Yeah, of course. Um, so having someone that you know direct you is probably very much different than, um, than having someone who's, you know, strictly professional, um, directing you. But what I gathered from the entire experience was, um, you know, it's okay to mess up. That's basically the, the general message that I got. It was, you know, me standing next to him. And him standing and basically coaching me silently while I'm going through it, you know, louder, louder, or, you know, pull back, pull back. Don't be so excited. Mm. Or, you know, um, very small cues that I ended up kind of absorbing into my own practice. So now it's, he doesn't need to coach me as much. Um, mm. So it's, really an excellent experience to have someone that you um, are used to directing you um, because you kind of have, they become kind of like the little voice in your head, you know, um, while you're recording, you can think like them and say, Oh, that was, that was too excitable. That mm. was too excitable or that was too loud. I can, I need to back off the mic. Mm. Um, so it was a really interesting, nerve wracking, um, but really valuable experience to have someone sitting there and listening to me and coaching me through the whole process, especially since it was my very first professional gig. Mm. It must be uh, an interesting difference where I guess when you've got a part that you are to read and you might or you might not have access to the rest of the script, um, mm -hmm. and then you're working with a director who has that broader knowledge of the, pro uh, the project and not only is listening for your performance, but also thinking about how that performance is going to be fitting in with the rest of that project and presumably uh, the other voice talent that will also be recording separately for it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, with my father being the one that actually produced the whole um, the whole video, it was extremely um, uh, valuable to have his input in how I sounded since he, um, you know, he had an image in his head of what he wanted the video to look like. You know, if there wasn't a pause on the page, he'd say, oh, you need to input a pause there so that I can put in this shot or this B-roll footage, whatever he needed. Um, and I could provide that for him. And it was wonderful to have kind of this back and forth input, um, based on, you know, professional, um, expertise. Mm, mm. So you got this project uh, for Steel Incorporated done. Uh, where did things go from there? Uh, how did you go about finding, uh, and sometimes I think that's a problem that a lot of people have, they'll get one gig and they'll either just ride high on the sense of that accomplishment um, or just feel like, okay, great, I've got one gig now what do I do next? What was what were your next steps in terms of moving on from there, keeping that momentum up and getting more work? Well, um, because I was so young and still in high school when I got my first professional gig, my my gigs were few and far between hmm. um, because of my schoolwork and um, and any clubs that I was in at the time. Uh, but I did end up moving on to similar. Uh, projects for, um, for other international companies like, like Bush, uh, which is a vacuum pump, uh, producer. Um, but once I ended up hitting college, I ended up taking a hiatus, um, from 
voiceover because, um, you know, living in a dormitory, you don't have the space to record in and I didn't have my equipment with me. Um, but this is kind of like my first year back from that hiatus. I can finally, um, carry on with the career that I was hoping for. And I did that by, um, by joining kind of a paid to play, haha, no pun intended. No worries. Uh, <laughs> a paid to play, um, website, uh, voice123.com, which is a wonderful site for people that are very serious about their career. Um, there are many others that you can join as well. Um, some are paid to play, others are free. However, the, um, the quality of, uh, companies that will post, of the gigs that are posted, um, that will vary based on the, uh, website that you join. Mm. Um, as far as, uh, doing an in-person, uh, career where you physically go into a studio, um, I have not had the pleasure of doing that. However, that's something that I would definitely be interested in. Mm, mm. Um, another thing I guess that, uh, can sometimes put people, put people off or, um, actually more accurately, uh, is something that people will sometimes use as, uh, a reason, uh, to stop is that taking a break and, People will sometimes think if they've not been doing it for a little while, they've lost the momentum, which means they've lost their shot. How was that, you know, after taking that first year uh, where you were living in the dormitory, um, what did you do to get back in? Um, did your circumstances change? Did you actually relocate at all? How did that happen? Yes, I um, I ended up living in dormitory for two years. Mm. Um and my third year in university, I, um, I ended up moving into my own apartment. Unfortunately, that apartment was shared with two other girls and, um, they had friends over. So it was, it was not a very ideal spot for recording. Mm. Um, however, now I'm in an excellent apartment with a beautifully big closet, ah. um, <laughs> in which I can record, um, for my projects. But, as far as picking up the pieces of uh, what I had before and trying to put them back together again into a viable career, um, it was tricky. It was very um, daunting. It was a daunting mm. task um, because I couldn't figure out if my voice was good enough anymore, um, if I was, you know, in practice enough to continue doing this professionally. Um so what I would do instead to keep up um, my voice was to just do little little voice training exercises um, while I was not recording during that hiatus period, during that break. Um, every now and again, I would just, you know, sit alone in, in the house and do voices or... Um, you know, stretch my voice as high as it could go and as low as it could go. Um, just try to keep my voice flexible so that it was always something that I could go back to um, when I had the chance. Mm. And I am sitting here, of course, taking notes because this is the kind of stuff that I uh, would want to do uh, or reckon I ought to know about. Um, the voice training exercises, so you'd uh, take your, your voice as high up as it could go, uh, drop it low... Um, uh, in terms of uh, just playing with characters, uh, were you uh, mimicking lines um, from things that you were seeing on TV or on the web? Uh, were you finding scripts in places? How did you, um, you know, how did you get yourself practice material? Well, I would usually just do impressions. Um, I'm very bad at impressions, but <laughs> <laughs> but the good thing about impressions is if you're really bad at them, then they turn into a completely independent character uh, than uh -huh. who you're trying to do. Mm. Um, so if I were to, you know, say try to do a Sean Connery impression, it would be just a horrible, horrible um, uh, character of a woman who can't do a Scottish accent to save to save her life. <laughs> <laughs> sure, you, sure, you probably wouldn't be shitting down to do that any time soon then, Lash. Probably not. <laughs> <laughs> so that's the wonderful thing about doing impressions of, of 
famous people or of characters on shows is that even if you mess up, you can still run with it and create something brand new with it. <laughs> um, <laughs> mm. So that's that's usually what I would do is take characters or um, or celebrities or anyone that I could think of that had a unique or interesting voice that I could imitate and try to imitate them, usually fail, end up creating something new. Hmm. Hmm. Um, did you, uh, dabble in any fan projects or anything like that in the meantime? I mean, from the sounds of it, you, um, uh, circumstances weren't ideal, but, uh, were you able to keep your hand in at all? Well, um, for a long time, I actually, embarrassing as it is, um, I was actually part of like a, of a singing group on YouTube. Um, ah. and so I, I did that for a while and, um, you know, part of my, Part of my uh, interest in the entertainment industry comes with writing and with um, singing as well as voice acting. So um, I would write lyrics for this group or I would sing for this group. Um, so I did that in the meantime. Um, but up until um, I came back, I really didn't do a whole lot of anything um, until I ended up going professional um, just this past year. Mm. Which is really upsetting for me. <laughs> yeah, I can uh, I can sort of imagine. So let's talk a little bit about uh, the beginning of the last year. Um, how did you then? I mean, uh, it needed to wait from the sounds of things until you got into that apartment uh, where you had that lovely big closet that you could uh, get into and do <laughs> recordings. Um, the first thing that leapt to mind when you mentioned the closet. Uh, Back in the day, I used to be a big fan of Red versus Blue, if you've ever heard mm. of it. Mm-hmm. No worries. So uh, no need to explain that. Although uh, for uh, those folks who are listening who might not be familiar with it, uh, Red versus Blue is a comedy web series that uh, is voiced over by uh, a bunch of utter nutters um, who <laughs> live around the Texas area. And it's uh, the visuals are created and animated using the Halo series of games. And it's all very uh, military, science fiction, humor, that kind of stuff. Um, it's, I think, in about its 10th year at the moment. Oh, so that's, that's, that's bloody incredible for a bunch of guys who are basically fooling around with capturing video, uh, out of the original Halo, which, you know, came out in the early 2000s. And yeah, uh, again, the reason why I bring it up was because I think in those early days, they did something similar. They had kind of a, a very small walk-in closet that could occupy two people and a microphone. And I think they put some basic, um, uh, acoustic muffling around the walls and basically just stood in there and did the recordings while the guy outside uh, made sure all the equipment was working and um, I would suppose gave a, a little bit of direction where he could. Um, so yeah, uh, what was, was that a similar situation? You, you found this closet and you soundproofed it and got your gear set up in there? Yeah, exactly. Um, for a long time, actually, after I moved into this apartment, I had trouble with um, with the acoustics in there because it would echo no matter what I did. Reverberation always. Um, I, you know, put moving blankets on the walls. I didn't have the money for acoustic foam. Um, it's very expensive. Mm. Uh, so I ended up trying to pad it with... Um, with blankets and clothes and anything I could. And it's a very large, um, walk-in closet. So, um, I didn't know what to do. So in the end, I kind of bit the bullet. Um, I ordered some acoustic foam and it came in a very conveniently sized box. Mm. So I ended up, um, being able to pad that box with my acoustic foam, um, stick my microphone in there, put it on this conveniently placed shelf in my closet. And um, from then on, it's been, you know, pure magic. Uh-huh. Amazing what foam can do. <laughs> I have I've seen the odd um, hack uh, online for people who say, you know, $25 uh, acoustic muffling setup for your microphone, where it just seems to be that. Um, getting a box to put your microphone in, putting some foam around it, uh, 
and that improves your audio quality significantly. So mm. in that regard, you you didn't actually wind up needing to put acoustic foam throughout the entire closet. You just used uh, used it for that box and then uh, kept the uh, the blankets and what have you that you had in there. Was that right? That's exactly right. Yeah, uh-huh. I uh, I actually no longer have blankets or clothes strung around. I uh, I was able to just have the box in my closet, and it sounds beautiful. It's wonderful, actually. I highly recommend acoustic foam. <laughs> oh, right. Um, and I do, I did make a note to ask about that. So with acoustic foam, um, even the cheap stuff that looks like it's about right from the job that you could get from, you know, your local, uh, hardware or, uh, rubber plastic product store kind of place doesn't really do the job. Would that be right? Um, no, probably not. Um, the stuff that I have, uh, I can't remember the company that makes it, but it's one inch thick. Um, and it's ribbed, um, acoustic foam. Um, it's a very special, dense kind of foam. So any, um, people will tell you to get mattress pad foam or, um, some may call it egg crates maybe. Um, but it really doesn't do the same job that a dense foam like acoustic does. Mm. Um, so I would definitely recommend, you know, investing in that acoustic foam because it will take you A very long way. Yeah. Now, if you are like me and you don't really have a closet-sized space in your apartment or house where you can set up, is that kind of um, almost uh, the dividing line between producing high-grade amateur and a professional result? Do you kind of need that? small space where you can set up a microphone uh, and do recording, even if you've just got uh, your mic set up in, as you have, a box of acoustic foam, you still need that sort of closet-sized space that you can effectively create a recording booth in. Mm -hmm. Well, um, the wonderful thing about it is that um, that's not necessarily what you need. Um, As long as you have an enclosed space, no matter how large, um, that is dampened, that is acoustically treated with, uh, foam is what I would recommend. Um, that is all that you need. I've seen many people that, um, you know, work in large rooms, living room sized rooms or bedroom sized rooms, um, that are, um, that are well treated with the foam on the walls. Um, or conversely, you could also just simply move a cardboard box to a desk anywhere um, in your house. Um, doesn't matter the size of the room because the um, the magic of a cardboard box is that it simplifies and uh, minimizes the space that your um, that the reverberation has to go. Mm. So as long as you um, minimize the space that you have um, within your and around your microphone, or you dampen the room. Mm. then it will um, still provide you with uh, professional quality okay. recording. So basically, as long as you've got the cardboard box soundproofed, uh, big enough to put your mic in and positioned right so that you can, of course, talk into it, uh, that is, that's the basic. That's, that's what you need. You might not necessarily have to go to uh, the occasionally extreme links that I've seen some people go to on YouTube where they've even... Scratch built their own little recording booths. Mm-hmm. Those are always um, going to bring you the best option. Um, many people will um, construct their own recording booths, you know, in a in a yard, or um, maybe they'll isolate a small portion of their room and fully acoustically treat that. Um, and that will probably bring you the most, um, the highest grade of recording that you could possibly get, Hmm. um, outside of a studio at least. But for, you know, someone who's, who's, um, on the, you know, lower end of spending, Hmm. um, I think a a cardboard box will do just fine for projects. Okay. So you got yourself set up and you started recording. Uh, you've already mentioned that you found voice123.com. Um, tell us a little bit about, I guess the early days 
when you had got yourself set up and then started looking for gigs, how early on in the piece did you find voice123.com? And if it was a little bit of a way down the track, did you get any gigs in the meantime? And what was the experience there? Well, I found voice123.com actually um, right out the gate. Um, it's very easy to find. Um, I simply um, went on Google and looked up um, places where uh, major businesses would post their gigs. So um, Voice123 is usually the first one that comes up on Google. And I've actually had a Voice123 account for a very long time, um, I think since 2013, so about three years now. Um, however, I only started paying for a subscription um, this past year. The unfortunate thing about Voice123 is that um, you cannot really uh, audition for roles unless you are specifically invited um, by the um, casting director. Mm. And that usually doesn't happen unless they've worked with you before. Yeah. So it's kind of a catch-22 there. So if you want to do something free, then probably Voice123 isn't for you. Mm. Um, however, once you do pay for the subscription fee on Voice123, I found that um, I was getting 20, 30, sometimes 40 auditions in my email inbox a day. Wow. Fantastic. Mm-hmm. So um, how do you then uh, winnow down all those lovely, glorious emails turning up in your inbox to projects that you want to audition for. And how long does uh, recording an audition take? How many do you usually wind up doing? Well, um, as far as how long it takes for me to kind of whittle down which auditions I want to pursue, um, Voice123 kind of has a mechanism to stop you from uh, over-auditioning, hmm. um, auditioning for everything just because you can. Yeah. Um, so Voice123 already has uh, some algorithm algorithms in place that will keep you from doing that. However, if you are just looking through the emails that you get, um, then it's really easy to kind of get carried away and want to audition for everything because you want all that glorious money that's mm. in your inbox and you want mm. all that wonderful experience because there's major companies that post on there. Mm. Um but the way that I always do it is I look at the um, the type of voice that they're looking for. Um, are they looking for a middle-aged female? Are they looking for a young female, a child, uh, sometimes middle-aged male? Um, obviously, that will whittle down um, for you. But if you are having trouble figuring out which auditions to take, I would recommend... Um, going with your gut, mm. whatever makes you feel like I really want to be a part of this. Um, usually the way that I know is if it's a character role, that's my passion. So I really want to be a part of any character roles I can find on there. If it's a large company, then it's worth the, the risk of potentially being rejected. Um, and sometimes even if it's, you know, depending on your need, if you're just looking for a paycheck right now, then sometimes doing a small time radio commercial would be excellent. Mm. Um, and that's one other thing that I would recommend looking for is the type of media that it's being transmitted for. Um, some are going to be radio or internal presentations. Um, I would recommend if it's going to result in more work for you, potentially because your voice is being transmitted over radio or your voice is on TV, then I would recommend um, pursuing those options. Okay, so uh, you got onto Voice123, you uh, started getting auditions. Uh, how did you... Um, you are now, of course, uh, as uh, has been... Uh, uh, I don't know if I've actually mentioned it in the lead-up, but um, uh, I think uh, on your profile... Uh, it actually lists you as a uh, a full time voice actor. So, I mean, 
you, when you got this appointment, uh, pardon me, when you got the apartment, of course, uh, you would have had to have been paying rent. How did you transition from, uh, however else you were, um, uh, bringing money in? I mean, I suppose, you know, when you're in, uh, at university, you have to pick up jobs here and there to pay the bills and all that kind of stuff. How did you, how did you transition from all the other things that you were doing into being able to base your entire income generating life around your voice work? Well, it was very difficult for sure. Um, it was, it took a lot of, um, of thought and consideration before I actually made the move from an hourly position to a freelance position. Mm. Um, but I found that if I was doing something that made me happy, that didn't feel like work, then it was worth the risk. Yeah. Um, and in addition, I didn't have a whole lot of a choice in the matter um, because of my university coursework. Um, I'm not able to hold an hourly position because of the hours. I'm basically working full time um, for my university coursework. And um, I just have only the hours that I spend at home um, as my free time. Mm. So I knew that I had to have something that could work with me from home. Um, and transitioning from that steady paycheck to that sporadic, sometimes no paycheck, um, is a tough, it's a tough transition, definitely. Um, uh, and sometimes it, it gets you down, but, um, the good thing about it is, um, it's quick. You don't have to wait for two weeks. There are times when times are really good and you get two, three checks in a week. And it feels amazing mm. to be able to be paid for hard-earned work that you love. Um, conversely, you know, if there's a drought, then um, it feels amazing when you even get a chance to audition for something. Yeah. Regardless, it feels amazing. So um, being a full-time voice actor and not getting that steady paycheck versus – being a part-time, you know, um, retail worker or whatever it may be, um, and getting a steady paycheck, I think it's a it's a fair trade-off for sure. But it's not for the faint of heart. <laughs> Definitely not for the faint of heart. Ah, no. Um, one question that uh, I think tends to, or one thought that tends to intimidate a lot of folks when they are starting to look at freelance work and going uh, on themselves uh, is setting a rate. Now, I'm definitely not going to ask you what yours is, but generally, how did you approach that idea of basically saying, okay, uh, this is what I want to work for and um, uh, deciding under what circumstances <clears throat> you'd be willing to negotiate around that? Well, um, as far as setting a rate goes, you, um, you need to place a, a monetary worth on your time. Mm. Um, and that's how my father described it. You know, he was a freelancer previously and that's how I got started. So I turned to him for a lot of advice, um, as far as my, my career went. But, um, you need to, to show some self worth. Um, if you're trying to get the jobs and end up trying to get the jobs by lowering your rate to the lowest it can possibly go, mm. it says something about what you think your your voice is worth. Mm. Um, so I would not recommend going absolutely dirt cheap um, for the sake of, of landing jobs um, because it, it affects your reputation negatively. Mm. Um, but for setting a rate for your time, you have to take in, into consideration – um, the type of medium that's being used for the project. Um, so if it were an internal presentation, then you might charge less than if it were a national television commercial, um, simply because of the amount of uh, work and the broadcasting that goes into that. Um, so naturally, if I were to do a television commercial, I would charge more than a radio commercial and radio commercial would charge more than maybe an internal presentation. Um, and so it's important to make sure that you 
value your your time, your equipment, your electricity bill, <laughs> mm. everything that can possibly uh, play into the um, the rate that you're offering someone. The everything that costs you money needs to be portrayed in what you um, charge as mm. far as your rate goes. Yeah. Um, I was interested in your comments regarding uh, setting a reputation for yourself in regards to how you value your work. Um, a couple of episodes ago, I was chatting with uh, a gentleman by the name of Ross Barber, who uh, he's not voice talent himself. He makes websites for uh, musicians and independent artists. And he sort of said something interesting that uh, it's okay at the start to work for free or cheap. Don't do it forever. Don't do it for long. But um, at least at the beginning, it's not such a bad thing. I mean, is that um, uh, is there? Do you think still room at least at the start when you are just getting a bit of experience under your belt for that sort of cheap rate kind of work, or should people really sit down if they do want to be serious and start thinking, okay, I might be just starting out, but let let's place a solid value on my time and not being willing to settle for free or extremely cheap. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I actually, I definitely do uh, agree with him um, that when you're first starting out, uh, gaining that experience is worth your time. Mm. Um, and that's the way that I would think of it. If you're starting out in voice acting, um, that the experience is how you're getting paid. Mm. Um, so if you are, you know, doing amateur work or if you're doing um, student film or whatever that may not pay you as well or at all, mm. um, that your pay is coming from the experience. Um, and like he said, you know, don't do it for long or, um, you know, for good. Um, you simply want to do it long enough to build up your resume, build up your, um, your experience and your voice, um, until you're confident and comfortable enough in what you do to pursue more professional routes. Um, and to actually set that rate. Um, but I did um, extremely low rate things at the beginning of this year. Now I'm moving and transitioning on to more um, higher rate projects. Mm -hmm. And even before I got back into my professional career, um, during those years um, in my, my early uh, 11, 12, 13 years, um, they, I simply did free amateur work, never did anything professional. Mm. Um, and that was all for the experience. So I think that there is value in doing things for free. There's also value in doing it because it'll, um, it'll positively, positively affect your reputation. Um, because you want to be seen as a, uh, as a master of customer service, mm. as a master and perhaps um, the most willing um, candidate to do whatever needs to be done to achieve the final goal, regardless of whether you're getting paid. Yeah. So I definitely agree. Okay. Now, uh, there are, of course, there is always that temptation when you start thinking about getting paid to play in the thing that you absolutely love doing, that once, uh, you know, when you're actually doing the work, um, it's non-stop gloriousness, it's all sunshine and rainbows, uh, everything is an absolute joy. And people tend to overlook that even when uh, you are doing the thing that you love, there is still a lot of um, maintenance and those sorts of uh, uh, general duty kind of things that you need to do just to make sure that uh, aside from standing in front of the microphone and bringing characters to life, uh, that you are maintaining your business and uh, your equipment and your voice as well. Um, can you take us through a little bit, uh, say, a, a glimpse into a week uh, of your life doing freelance voice work and uh, some of the things that you um, that you have to do and how much time you put into recording? Well, I, um, as far as every single day goes, I 
sing in the car and I do voices mm. um, in the car on my way to and from work to kind of stretch my voice, get it ready for the day. And, you know, I, I teach. So that's a wonderful exercise in itself. It really opens up um, my voice very mm. well. <laughs> um, but in addition, um, once I get home and actually get started on on projects, um, the tedious parts come from maybe um, rifling through all those auditions that I get in my email. That's extremely tedious. But once you find an an audition and uh, you know decide that you want to audition for that, um, all that process rifling through your email is probably about um, an hour to um, a week um, for me if I keep up with it well. Mm. Um, but once I decide on an audition, um, I simply have to, um, do some warm ups on the microphone, which takes maybe, maybe 10 minutes. Um, and then actually auditioning takes, uh, probably half an hour per audition. Mm. Um, I record multiple takes, um, in multiple voice styles, uh, multiple intonations, um, so it ends up taking about half an hour an audition, um, which if I end up falling behind on my quota that I set for myself per week, um, can end up taking a very long time before I finally emerge from the closet. <laughs> so, <laughs> so it can, it can get kind of tedious auditioning for roles, but mm. recording for a project would be, um, maybe depending on the size of the project, maybe an hour's worth of recording. Mm. And uh, uh, how much maintenance work do you have to do after the recording? I mean, my experience, especially doing this podcast, is that I'll usually have to spend an amount of time. The clean-up itself is not too big a deal, although I might still, as I listen through, take chunks out. But <clears throat> with this, I try and listen through the episode once, even if I do it on high speed. Uh, take any, uh, do any edits as necessary, uh, make another round of notes as I go through just in case there's anything I've missed. Um, but, uh, uh, and then of course I've got the, I have to then export the file, uh, as an MP3 for uploading. Um, what sort of, uh, work do you have to do once you've completed an audition? Once I've completed an audition, I end up um, spending maybe uh, half an hour touching it up. So um, that's not necessarily modulating my voice in any way or adding effects. Um, I am able, luckily, because of that wonderful cardboard setup, um, I'm able to pretty much get away with uh, no reverberation, no background noises. Um, I pretty much threaten my roommates under threat of death that <laughs> if they make a noise, it's done. Mm. It's done. But, um, so they're wonderful about not making any noises that I have to edit out. Um, the only problem would be editing out, ugh, editing mm. out the, um, the slip ups, any of my, uh, any of my word jumbling that I tend to do or us or ums, which as you probably noticed is a problem for me. Mm. Um, but I, that usually takes about half an hour to edit it out. Um, and compress it all back together. Um, after that, I render it into an MP3 and um, upload it into a proposal. And the proposal is probably the thing that takes the longest of um, of the audition process. I could spend maybe two hours on a on a proposal uh, to send off to a, a casting director, um, and that usually involves me telling them my rates. Uh, what my skills are, why they should hire me for the job, and then it's all the proofreading and revising that I want um, in order to get the job. It's like a cover letter. Aha, uh -huh. okay. Um, is that something that, I guess, with experience, gets any quicker? I mean, uh, it does sound like the kind of thing where, admittedly, you are always auditioning for a specific project, but, I mean, there's always your list of skills uh, which, you know, presumably if you've got a library and you've got these organized, you can almost take chunks and just assemble them all together. Uh, does that process of putting that proposal together get any easier or at least any, you know, any quicker, any more efficient? 
Mm-hmm. It absolutely does. Um, and just like you said, uh, your skills pretty much always stay the same, except when you're auditioning for vastly um, unique uh, projects. But pretty much they always stay the same. You always have the same contact information, pretty much always the same um, uh, rate information. It's really just a matter of almost changing the names and uh, catering your latter half of the proposal that talks about why you should choose uh, you for the job. Mm. Um, that's the, the part that would take maybe 10 minutes. Um, so nowadays, now that I have all that um, kind of pinned down for myself, um, I usually spend maybe 15 minutes on a proposal. Okay. Um, one thing you actually mentioned a little bit earlier on uh, is uh, that you sing in the car uh, on your way to and from work. Now, just to clarify, uh, this actually isn't, um, well, it is work, but it's part of your education <laughs> degree. So this is, uh, is this you going to a, a school or university to basically be a teacher during the day hours? Um, yeah, that's correct. Uh, I said work as a slip of the tongue, I guess, but, um, it feels like work. It feels like yeah. full-time job. Um, uh, but yes, so I teach at a, at a local, um, academy, um, for international baccalaureate students. And, um, I do that for full contract hours, um, which is 7.30 in the morning to 4 p.m. Right. Um, before I can come back. So, to and from my, I guess, uh, my student teaching, my teacher candidate placement, whatever you want to call it, work, <laughs> um, before I can finally um, spend time on actual work, mm. um, which would be my voiceover career. Mm. So is that something that, I mean, you've done three years of university on this education degree. Looking forward, is that kind of something that you're looking at doing alongside voice work, actually becoming um, uh, a part-time or full-time teacher? Well, in um, in all honesty, I did intend to do uh, full-time teaching um, for, a, uh, for a career. However, recently, um, just with the way that education has been going mm. in, um, in America, um, I've kind of backed off of the idea of uh, teaching full-time. Um, perhaps I'll pick up some substitute teaching contracts, um, which are, you know, low-risk, low-reward, mm. um, and day-to-day contracts. But um, I think that now I'm more focused on um, on propelling my, my acting career, my voice acting career, and maybe even going into um, full on-camera acting. Mm. You mentioned before we started uh, chatting for the episode proper that things have been a little bit tough lately, especially as you are moving into the final phase of your degree. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about that, uh, what you've had to do with regard to your voice work and uh, uh, when you expect things uh, might be able to pick up for you again? Of course. Um, so lately it's been tough because it is the final two weeks of my uh, undergraduate degree. Um, so I'm graduating in just under a month. Um, before, uh, I finally have full free time, uh, to focus on my voice work. So right now it's, um, it's not necessarily a lot of exams, but, um, it's the end of the, uh, of the academic year. Um, so all of my students at my, uh, at my full time work, I suppose I will call it, um, at my school, um, they're all doing their standardized tests that we have in America, and um, they're really, really focusing on making sure that the kids are ready to move on, and I teach eighth grade. So they're pushing that we're ready to move on to high school. Mm. So um, it's been a very stressful time both at the school and at home because I'm focused so much on what I'm doing at the school that I don't have time to um, audition for for jobs um, when I'm home. So lately, I've been stretched a little bit thin with the um, with money as far as um, 
my voiceover career goes. So it's been stressful, but um, I anticipate that within the next three weeks, I'll be able to return to normal. Um, my last day of teaching is the 29th, so it should um, die down afterwards, and I'll be able to get back into the saddle. <laughs> Fantastic. Well, I can't wait to find out how that goes in a couple of weeks' time. And, of course, by the time this episode goes live, it'll probably have been uh, a few weeks past that point anyway. Um, <laughs> so uh, one thing I do want to ask about, do you have any particular uh, voice work role models or voice talents whose work you just sort of enjoy? I mean, I'm one of these kinds of people who does like to have a look at the credits of things. So, uh, I mean... Straight off the top of my head, if we're talking about Mass Effect, um, uh, two names that immediately leap to mind, Mark Muir and Jennifer Hale, the voices oh, of Shepard, yes. depending on which way you want to look at, and uh, uh, Raphael Sparge, who played um, Garrus and who has oh, been yeah. done tons of voice work and, of course, has been uh, on TV as well and in movies. I mean, yeah, who were, who were some of your favorites? I'll let you name drop. <laughs> You've named a couple of my favorites. Um, I love Jennifer Hale. Um, and um, in addition, I adore Steve Bloom. Um, Steve Bloom, who's done um, a number. He's very, very active in the anime scene. Um, so he's done, uh, his most notable would probably be Spike Spiegel from Cowboy Bebop. Right. Um, and he's uh, recently... Um, actually, my boyfriend and I uh, recently started watching a new anime called Dudarara, and he actually makes an appearance in there um, as Kyohei. Um, so he's very, very active, uh, pretty much a, <laughs> for lack of a better term, a household name um, in that community. Mm. Um, in addition, I love Tara Strong. Um, I think she's an incredibly talented and versatile actress. She plays Harley Quinn. She plays... Um, Bubbles from the Powerpuff Girls. <laughs> she plays, uh, Raven from Teen Titans. Um, she has a huge, massive, uh, repertoire. And probably my final one would be, um, because I'm both a Star Wars lover and a, um, and a Batman lover, Mark Hamill. Of course. Um, who is the one and only Joker. <laughs> Though I will not say that any of the other Jokers are terrible. They are wonderful at what they do. But Mark Hamill is quite incredible. Yeah. I still remember um, watching Batman the Animated Series when um, I was a youngster. And, uh, um, God, you're 21, um, <laughs> yeah, I think that Yes, I think it pretty much started before you were born and actually sort of watching the credits and going, hang on a second, that said Mark Hamill. And then, you know, listening to episodes where the Jokers are going... Yeah. Yes, that's him. My God. And he was, <laughs> he was bloody fantastic as the Joker. I mean, as you well know, they dragged him back for the bloody, uh, uh, the Batman Arkham games. And, um, mm -hmm. I think he and Kevin Conroy have, have reunited again to do the, uh, the killing joke. Yes. Um, I'm so excited about that. Oh, that, um, yeah, I've, I've got the, uh, the, the graphic novel of that. And that's, uh, that was that was certainly a, a dark little work, but yeah, it'll be uh, it'll be interesting to hear those two bring that to life. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Uh, so yeah, Steve Bloom, Tara Strong, and Mark Hamill. God. Um, uh, I, could, I mean, heck, I could almost go on for a while as well. I mean, uh, but anyway, uh, from the sounds of it, I mean, we sort of. I usually like to ask people, you know, what's next, but from the sounds of it, we sort of. Uh, as you're coming toward uh, the end of your studies, we we kind of um, um, we've kind of got that nailed down. But are there any you know particular uh, voice work goals that you've got for yourself? Any uh, dream genres or sort of specific projects that you would dearly love to be able to work on if you had half a chance? Oh goodness, I would absolutely adore to be in any sort of professional comic book character. Um, you know, if I could play Harley Quinn, though my Harley Quinn is a little bit shaky. Uh -huh. Um, if I could play Harley Quinn, that'd be wonderful. If I could play Batgirl, that'd be wonderful. I'm a huge lover of the superhero genres <clears throat> and 
Um, I'm also a huge lover of, um, of any sort of, um, anime dubs. I love those. I think they're so fun. Mm. And, um, there are certain companies that I really, really, uh, would love to work for, you know, Funimation who really puts their heart and soul into, into every dub that they do, um, of any show. Um, so working for, um, any kind of, um, outrageous characters, superheroes, um, you know, magical girls even, um, I think that would be so incredibly, um, uh, wonderful to, to pursue. Mm. Mm. Uh, well, in closing, if there were three things that perhaps you wish that someone had told you when you were getting started out, or maybe that someone did tell you when you were getting started out, because it sounds like you definitely had um, a, a great support network mentoring experience there with your father being in the industry, uh, that would perhaps help somebody who was looking at getting started, whether just getting paid to play in general or in voice work specifically, what would those three things be? Um, the first would probably be not to be picky. Don't be picky about the voice work that you get um, when you are just starting out. I want you to try everything because um, you never know what you'll like, what you can do, what you can't do until you actually try to do it. Um, so I would say... Don't be picky, even if it's a really horrible, um, horrible animation, um, uh, fan amateur project. Um, I would say definitely go for it. Um, it's definitely excellent to have that experience under your belt, even if it doesn't end up going anywhere and doesn't become recurring work. Mm. Um, the second thing would probably be to invest in yourself. Um, originally I had thought maybe you would invest in a good microphone, invest in, um, in a good setting to record in, but all in all, you're investing in, in yourself, in your career, in your voice. Um, so that includes finding excellent equipment. Do not skimp on your microphone. Um, don't skimp on your, um, recording environment whether it's in a studio, in a closet, in a cardboard box on your desk, whatever. Um, don't skimp in what um, will truly make it professional grade. That also means that um, you should invest in acting classes. Um, I myself have not had the chance to take one, but by taking one, I would be bettering my uh, my expertise and my skills and furthering them so that I became a more wholesome professional. Um, and the final thing would probably be that um, rejection is not personal and it's not shameful. Uh, if you get rejected, it's just part of the business. It's part of um, the experience to be rejected. And personally, I don't even, um, it doesn't phase me anymore. So if you get rejected, it may bum you out if you were really hoping for that one role, but there will be others. And um, being rejected is not uh, something that only happens to you. It happens to everyone. Um, no matter who you're talking to, they've been rejected multiple, multiple times. Mm. And they probably get rejected more times than they get um, hired. So it's important to think of rejection not as um, a punishment for not being good enough, but more as a... Um, as a chance to move forward in another direction. Mm. Filter, filtering your opportunities down in a way. Exactly. Mm. Now, uh, having listened to this wonderful chat, where can people go to find out more about you and perhaps engage your services? Well, um, if you are interested in learning more about um, who I am and what I do, um, I do have a LinkedIn page. You can find me under Ann Twork, A-N-N-T-W-O-R-E-K is my name. Um, or you can find me on voice123.com at voice123.com forward slash Ann Twork. Um, that is where you can go to hire me or to contact me for any projects you'd like to pursue with me. No worries. And folks, if you are listening, there will be links to both Anne's LinkedIn profile and her voice123.com uh, pages in her in the show notes for this episode. 
So, Anne, once again, thank you very much for your time. It's been lovely chatting with you, especially um, about a sector of work that I am very much interested in getting involved with myself. And, um, yes, just uh, being able to uh, geek out with you a little bit about, uh, about <laughs> it all. So um, uh, thank you once again for coming on the show. Thank you so much for having me. It's been such a pleasure and it's so fun to talk to you.